thank you, thank you, thank you to our to our staff administrators for helping us set things up today. As they leave the room, I get to thank them. This is unusual. <laughs> so to Liam and Chloe, and um, thank you all for coming as well this evening. Um, a special thanks to our speaker, Claudine Bautignon. Um, we are very happy to be able to welcome you here tonight. And I'm very happy to see that there's a nice turnout in the room for the first week of term. So I hope this will um, set the tone for people focusing hard on um, on their work uh, in the area of South and Southeast Asian art over um, over the coming term. So uh, Claudine Bautipon, I'm sure, doesn't need an introduction for many of you. I'll give a very brief one. Uh, she, as I understand it, spent her career between uh, two different places. One, the Senas uh, Research Institution uh, in Paris, and uh, then also in a teaching position at the Free University in Brussels. Uh, so she uh, has focused uh, primarily on South Asian materials, um, and Bihar, Bengal, uh, Bangladesh, as many of you know no doubt, but has also looked at the uh, relations with Southeast Asian materials. And we'll be hearing some of that uh, this evening. What we won't be hearing about, perhaps as in detail, is the uh, very developed work that she's done uh, on the uh, crowned Buddha, also looking uh, very intensively at, um, at Burma and on the specific work nope. that she has done um, on Pagan itself. So I'm, as you will notice, I'm focusing on the Southeast Asia um, materials because, of course, this is a talk within the Southeast Asian Art Academic Program uh, series with the Center for Southeast Asian uh, Studies. So we, we are very keen to uh, take over uh, from South Asian dominance of the field of art history. Um, and this is also something that I think is uh, of interest to all of us. It's quite rare, um, and mistake, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, it seems to me that it's quite rare that one looks at Southeast Asian materials as a means of understanding South mm -hmm. Asian materials um, for historical reasons uh, way back when, as well as not so long ago, um, we often look the other way how can we learn about Southeast Asian art by using the South Asian models? And um, of course, there's uh, much more extensive research on South Asian models than there is on Southeast Asian materials. So um, this has certainly skewed the field um, for the likes of uh, myself and many of us in the room, I think, for, um, for uh, the life of Southeast Asian art history. And it's very nice uh, for us to see uh, another approach Mm -hmm. um, also from someone who begins as a, as a South Asianist. So I hope this will be of interest to all of you. I'm very um, much looking forward to the talk. Um, and perhaps I'll leave it at that. We we have about 45 minutes or so. Is that, you can, you can go on for longer if you like. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think, uh, I will not, uh, ex I'm not expecting that you can do more than 45 or 50 minutes. I don't know, I have five pages. I'm in 44 slides. I am usually don't read, the text is just there, but I don't read. So um, we'll see how it goes. Yes. Okay. Yes. But we will have time for questions afterwards. So please hold your fire during the talk, uh, take your notes and be prepared to ask questions afterwards. And that's um, for me, at least often part of the exciting moment in our talks here is to bring out um, all the different perspectives from um, our audience, which is uh, quite varied in terms of uh, national background, educational background, uh, disciplinary expertise. Um, so that's, I hope, will be exciting as well. So thank you, Claudine, again, and thank you all for helping me to welcome Claudine with us today. Well, I'm thanking you and your colleagues who arranged my coming here today. Uh, as uh, Professor Thompson just said, in fact, my field of research, main field, initial field of research was Eastern, so-called Eastern India, meaning Bihar, Bengal, and Bangladesh. And um, as you, as she also reminded just a few minutes ago, uh, one usually looks at this part and see what is the influence coming from this part of the South Asian concept continent to Southeast Asia. I will um, concentrate on period going in from the 11th to the end of the 12th century, even 13th century, and asking what, what do you have in, uh, I have to start from South Asia. So this is the area which we, with which we are dealing. So 
Eastern India, 11th, 12th century, is a major period in major area for the development of Buddhism in this so-called Vajrayana form. We know that relations were very much intensive with various parts of Southeast Asia, with part with the Tibet, with China, with also other parts of India. I removed the, the arrow, which I had also arrows going to various parts of India, of monks who travel to Bihar, Bengal. So this, is, this was really the center of the Buddhist world at that time, one must know it. So I'm very much sorry that this is so dark, but it's not an area of darkness, as some writer wrote a long time ago. This is the map of Eastern India, and normally it's green. It should be green. <laughs> um, what I want to show on this map is an, after the main region in this 11th, 12th century period, which were very much active in the field of Buddhist art. You have one main region, which is the one on the north, which goes from Bihar on your left to North Bengal. You have there a diff various different sites, monasteries. The main site is, of course, Bodhgaya, the place where Shakyamuni became a Buddha. You have then at that period major sites like Nalanda. I, I cannot stand because if I stand, the camera is not more taking ah. me. And then it's <laughs> so. Um, May I do it? May I? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so you have here Bodhgaya, there you have Nalanda. On the Ganga, you have the site of Vikramashila, another major Buddhist monastery. Going further to the east, you have this arrow shown Jagadala, which is a monastery built at the end of the 11th century. The two other sites are earlier sites, Parapur and Mahasangar. Mahasangar going back to much earlier period. So this is one major area for development of this Buddhism, and the inheritance of this Buddhism went mainly to Tibet. Then you have another area, which is in South Bengal, which is the area shown here, with one major site, which is Vikramapura. Vikramapura is practically the old Dhaka. It's source of Dhaka, in fact. It's a major site which had a number of relationships with Southeast Asia. And the first character whom we can relate from the region of Vikrampur with Southeast Asia and probably with South Sumatra is Atisha. Atisha, we know him from the Tibetan sources, but Atisha, the tradition says that he was from a royal family, but anyway, the tradition says also that he was from Vikrampur. And what we know is that he spent 14 years in a monastery, probably in South Sumatra, anyway, in Indonesia. Then came back to India, became the chief abbot of Vikramashila, and then went to Tibet. So this is one major monk, probably a peak of the iceberg. There must have been hundreds of monks traveling, and their name just remain anonymous. Another major monk whom we should meet, also mentioned, and who lived one century later, is a Kashmiri monk, who lived very old, as you can see, Shakyashri Badra, and he is very important. We will come with his name more than one time during this lecture. Although he never went to Southeast Asia, he came to Bihar. He became the chaplain of the king in a place called Jayanagara. And there is a village called Jayanagar in the city of Lakisarai. This is where uh, the arrow is showing. Lakisarai is today conglomerate of different villages, like a small town with a main railway station. Uh, it's, it's a site which is known since the 19th century, where many, many major images of Vajrayana tendency have been discovered. But unfortunately, the excavations only started some years ago, which means that for 100 years, the site has been looted. Many images have been collected in the 19th century. We will see some of them. Some are in Calcutta, some are in Patna, some are in Berlin, some are in St. Petersburg. <laughs> Shakya Shibadra, after becoming the chief abbot of Nalanda and Vikramashila, left with his monks to Jagadala, North Bengal, the other arrow, and from there he left for Tibet. And from there, at the end of his life, he went back to his homeland, Kashmir, where he passed away. So you have there two characters, 
One is more going to the north, one going to the south. But I show them because they they really show what were the monks, what they were doing. I mean, traveling a lot. Again, the same map, not so much green, dark, with the same region which we have seen, and with two characters at least which we will meet again during this talk, which I'm going to concentrate. One is the Mahakala. Mahakala is a major deity in Lakisarai. That's why I put this image on the left part of the screen. We'll see better slides in a moment. And the other one is the Hevadra, who was a major deity in the region of Vikrampur Mainamati. And another aspect of Hevadra, which we found in North Bengal, but this we don't see him in Southeast Asia, so I just put a picture of him, Chakra Samvara, just to show that there also there was um, an aspect of him who was worshipped. This is another point which has been also as far as South Asia, I mean, this part of the material in um, South Asia has been considered not really uh, dealt with. It's just that images are described in text. You have the image, you have the text, and then they, be, they are identified. But very little attention has been paid to when was the image made and where was it made? Because that you can really see there, there is really a group of images showing this Bodhisattva, or there is more this aspect of the Tara, or this aspect of the Vishnu, showing that there are really regional, local tendency in, this, in representing one or the other deity. And this helps in what we are going now to see, which are the relations with Southeast Asia. The first character, the first image I want to show is an image which is now lost, which already when it was discovered, probably nearly 100 years ago by the Dutch archaeologist who was in a very bad condition. This is an old picture. You see, you just have a puzzle of fragments. Mm. This is uh, Heruka, Hevadra, who was the main deity in Padang Lavas, which is a huge site in North Sumatra, where you have a number of small temples. So this um, Heruka is seen, as he is seen in Eastern India, if I remember, no, uh, here are just fragments of, you see, the color uh, photos were made by uh, Daniel Perret and they're really what remains, what has been found today. So you see that today the state of conservation is even less than what it was 100 years ago. So he is here on the left and of course he relates very closely to images found in South Bengal. My Namati, Subapur, that's in the uh, site which are not far away from Vikrampur and the uh, image on the right is a small painting, I mean, it's no more than six centimeters in eight, in fact, belongs to a manuscript which is distributed between different libraries and museums. It's dated, luckily, around 1100. The, f the f color phone is in Baroda, but this uh, painting here, this, the folios, is in the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin. So you have here this deity, Evadra, uh, having a human body, trampling on a corpse, and in certain cases, like this image here, surrounded by yoginis. I mean, these are these female terrific deities. He has eight, we will come back to them again. Uh, the, it has been suggested by a um, scholar, by a colleague, that the image of uh, Padang Lavas being so close to the image from uh, Vikrampur was probably an import from Bengal. But uh, an analysis of the stone shows that it's a local product. He has the attribute, which are his attribute. He has a, the kapala, I mean the skull in the left hand. He has a katvanga, this long stick, and he has the vajra in the, up, in the right hand. So some more images also showing you that um, destruction and disappearance of images not only found since in Padang Lavas, but also in Bengal. Uh, the image on the left is my Namati, but the two, one, uh, the two other pictures, as you see, I made them from book. The book was published in 1909. It's a Bengali publication in Bengali written. And these are two images which are one of them completely lost, which is the one on the right side. The one in the center is in fact in a Pakistani Pakistanese collection. It was transported there in 1972. So there what you have showing you what is Eruka, who, who is he? 
Well, he's at the center of a mandala. I already mentioned the eight yoginis, these eight female dancers. They are here also. And he's also at the center of eight cremation grounds, which are depicted here on this image on the above part. Well, it's secondary to the topic of today. I mean, you have eight trees with different scenes, but it shows that he is really at the center of the mandala. And this reminded us, of course, of uh, bronzes which were found in uh, Cambodia, which dates to the end of the 12th century. So, which probably are dated usually during the reign of Jayavarman the Seventh, where apparently there was a development of the worship of Heruka. You have here this very beautiful bronze on the left part with the eight yoginis dancing around him. We do not have such uh, great things in Bengal, Bihar. It doesn't mean that they could not make it, but maybe the bronze have been melted, they have disappeared, or maybe they did not have the concept of making it this way. Because the, the icon, I mean, it can be one deity, one character, but seen in different cultural settings, it, it's the way of showing him or showing her, in fact, answers also the aesthetic taste or development or attitude of the local people. This, uh, as it has been, I mean, some, some uh, papers have been written on this uh, Hevadra in Cambodia by uh, a colleague now here in the SOAS, Peter Sharrock, and he showed quite clearly, I think, that it really, uh, I mean, he really emerged, its worship emerged really in the reign of Jayavarman the Seventh, and you have here two fragments, and the one on the left is in the Metropolitan Museum, it's a huge image, if I remember, it must be one meter fifty in eight, showing you that it was a huge sculpture uh, of the deity who was there depicted, showing really its importance. Um, so now, this is what I was saying, mentioning, I mean, aesthetics can be different, but the, the concept of deity is there in the back, the same. I mean, in Cambodia, you have uh, different heads from different levels, one put above the other. You don't have that in Bengal. You have here an example where you see that he is supposed to have four heads, three are visible. He has also numerous arms. He can also have numerous arms. But in this position, he's not trampling on cores. He's not, I would say, sometimes when I say dancing, it's of course a dance position, but it's also trampling on the corpses below. Is seen, in fact, in India in a position of victory, as it's called, Alida Azana. Uh, but around him, you have also the yoginis. So you see them around his feet. So, uh, and above him, there is a fourth one. So you can have the same concept seen in different countries, but very differently depicted. Now, uh, another aspect of the deity again in Bengal, North Bengal, and uh, compared to the example in um, Cambodia, uh, where you can see that uh, there is a character who is there trampling on course or dancing, but in fact it is a pratnya of the deity. And I, I do not know, maybe they made it, maybe they created this image, but I do not know if in Cambodia you have this kind of image, pratnya, and uh, that's really an Indian concept, which was then transported to the north, to Tibet, more than Southeast Asia. But you see that the Naratnya, the Pradnya, who the female of the deity, she is depicted, in fact, in this very elegant light and force of strength, uh, position of dance or trampling the deity. And here again, you see, he may have a number of heads, but in India, they are really put on the same level all around. And you have this number of arms all around. So now that we have seen the Hevadra Heruka connection, there is another character who appears in Padang Lavas, and it's Mahakala. So right, we have the Heruka which we have seen, and in the very same temple where these fragments of Heruka were found, another image was found, which was partly gilded. The image is only known from old photos. It has completely disappeared. This is a small picture which we have on the left. It's not a good picture because it's made really from an old photograph, which is already not so, so good. 
what do you have there? Well, you have a male character with so-called hair standing on ends, which is this kind of aura, which is not a halo, it's really his hair all around. You can see here, and we'll see, we compare it with Indian models, you will recognize it, uh, a garland of skulls. He has his arms a bit awkward depiction because probably the artist did not know really how to do it. They were not familiar with this iconography. One hand is here, should keep the krapala, and the other one, which is on the hip, should have a knife for cleaning the krapala. Now we have to go back to India to come to come understand the iconography. The image in the center was found in Tripura district, which is India. Tripura is India today, but Tripura is in fact east from Bangladesh and east from the Vikrampur area. So in those times, it was in fact one single large uh, cultural area. So you can see very clearly there that he has a kapala, that he has a knife at the level of his hip, the garland with the hats, and the image on the right is an image which was found in Lucky Sarai and which is now in the Hermitage, which shows in fact the very same uh, iconography. So in India, you have this model and the Palang Lava's image, in fact, is based on such image. Now, the interesting thing is, what do these two deity do together in a small shrine? Well, uh, Mahakala is in fact a protector of the Hevadra Mandala. So one can understand there is a relation between both of them. And, oh, this is much too red, <laughs> but much too colored. This is a cloth painting from Karakocho. Karakocho is a site in Central Asia, so I'm taking you very far away, tra lot, traveling a lot to Asia. Uh, where a number of uh, cloth paintings have been discovered, which are preserved in the Hermitage also. And on this um, cloth painting, and they are dated from the 12th and 13th, early 13th century, uh, you have the main deity multi-armed with his pradnya, and below in the white circles is in fact the Mahakala, so protecting the deity. In fact, you have to see yourself to, to re-put practically what is there depicted in a three dimension. You have the central deity trampling, dancing with his prania, and in front of him is Mahakala. So you, as a human being, you are just outside the mandala, and between uh, you and the deity, you have the Mahakala protecting somehow the field of um, Hevadra. So both are together, bound together, and one can understand why in Palanglavas you had bound together both together. Now, um, Mark Hala uh, is not um, unknown in um, Southeast in Indonesia. We have seen the one of Palanglavas, which can be dated 11th, 12th century. Dating is very difficult for this site. There is another one, which apparently also has disappeared, which was found in Chandi Jago in East Java. And you have him here. Hmm? You have a number of fragments you have in here. This is a blown up from uh, this photo, again, photo of the Dutch archaeological department. And you see that it was also uh, in a poor condition, well, fragments, in fact. Uh, and uh, you see that in this uh, hair, you have a small niche with a depiction of a Buddha. You recognize the skull, the kapala in the left hand, and the knife uh, in the right hand, just like the one which we saw at Padang Lavas. You see that clearly on the slide, which is on the right. So we have these two one, Padang Lavas and Chandi Jago. So there is a third one, which is the one which is very well known and which is usually named Bairaf but I don't enter here into the discussion uh, by Raf or not by Raf. Um, at that moment, at that period, and in this context, we have to see the character as Mahakala. Whether he has become a by I mean, a Shaiva as aspect afterwards, it's okay. I accept it. <laughs> but at that time, it's definitely an aspect of um, Mahakala. He was found in Sumatra, central Sumatra, but it was most probably made, produced in East Java. 
The image of the Chandijago, uh, dated in the second half of the 13th century, we'll see later on in which context the Mahakala has been done. And most probably, uh, the artists who made the large Pandaudako image got inspired partly from this image. Because if you pay attention to the headdress, you see that there is kind of globe. I mean, the hair makes really a circle, a bubble. And you have a small niche also in the headdress of the Padangloko image, which shows that it's a Buddha. It shows that this is a Buddhist image and not a Shaiva image. It was created as a Buddhist image and not a Shaiva image. But of course, we have features which are typically Javanese, like the, the row of skulls here and the deity. And you have here a cross also. So um, this image, in fact, the Padangloko image, uh, is quite properly dated. I wrote around 1350. In fact, it has an inscription dating it back to uh, 1347. I come back to him also after a moment. I just want to finish this um, display of Maakala image in South, I mean, in Indonesia, with this uh, uh, gilded dagger which was found in Sumatra. And uh, it has, uh, so on the blade which was gilded, you can still see, it's seen on the detail on the right side, you have uh, Mahakala. And on the other side uh, of the blade, you had, in fact, a female deity, which I show here just in a small vignette on the left that you see it. And if you pay attention, if you look properly, you will see that, in fact, it's really the same iconography. You have here the garland with the skull, you have the left hand in front of the dress with the kapala, and he had the knife in the right uh, hand. So you had really this aspect of Mahakala, which is they found in Sumatra, but also in uh, Eastern Java at that period, 12th, 13th century. Now, again, uh, I compare these three main images left with, again, the image which is uh, from Lucky Sarai. You see him standing, you see him with the garland of Kapala, of skulls, you see him, the skull in the left hand, the knife, I mean, this is really a very same um, iconographic context. Now, Mahakala uh, was also a major deity in other part of, well, it's still it's between Far East and Southeast Asia, it's an intermediary region, it's, it's, which is Yunnan. With the Dali Kingdom, it's there in the middle of the map. And I put also this map here, which shows you, in fact, that this uh, area was, in fact, at the center of a major trade roads. You had roads going to India, to the Brahmaputra Valley, trading horses from Yunnan to Bengal till a later period. And I refer for this part of the presentation to the work which has been done in the recent years by Megan Bryson, who really specialized, if I may say, on the images, iconography of the Dali Kingdom. Uh, there are not so many images of Mahakala, but from the text which he read and translated and analyzed, uh, it's obvious that he was there to protect the state. As she says, the texts were coming from China. But the iconography, the concept, the way of making the image got more inspired from what's happening in South Asia, in India. So you have him here with two arms, and I have to look here now, <laughs> two, two arms. You have, you see differences, of course. You have this Katvanga, which is here, which is kept here in another hand. But he has a Kapala, you see that it's practically reversed for the iconography. He may have elements which are not found in uh, Bengal Bihar, like a small drum, the Damaru, which is kept here in his uh, left end. Oof. Sorry. Oops. Oh, sorry. Let me go back. So this is what I show, and then next one. Next one is terrible. Because, <laughs> well, it's a Mahakala. You know, Mahakala is a great black. Don't forget it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That's uh, that's the meaning of the name. Uh, so what I wanted to show you is uh, an image of Mahakala from Lakisarai. 
is that there are, again, as I mentioned, just the similarity, some attributes are there which are taken, but you see they're not put exactly in the same positions. So the concept is there, but locally there is own image which is created. Uh, again, here, not the image where you have the damaru, the small drum, which you don't have in Lucky Sarai, but you will see in a moment in Bengal, you have the akshamala, the rosary, which is kept in the low right hand, the, the right screen, and uh, you have also um, akshamala and parsha, which are kept there in the hands. And this, uh, the image on the left, is a, in the so-called long hand scroll, which is dating from the 11th, 12th century. Uh, but the image on the right is, in fact, a drawing of a carving. Yes, and uh, in fact, the Akshamala, the rosary, is kept, is shown by a quite unique image of Mahakala, which uh, is from Vikrampur. And the small drums are found in later images from Nepal. So you see, there is, as why I was mentioning, the Brahmaputra route and the contact with Bengal from Yunnan. There, there was there really a connection. And in the treasure of the three pagodas in Delhi was found, for instance, a ceiling from Bodh Gaya. So monks were traveling the road, like the traders were traveling the road and bringing back souvenir. There was there really a relation between these two areas. So there in Yunnan, he was a protector of the state, like probably, he was most probably also in uh, Java, uh, Sumatra, because the fact that um, this image, which was brought, the Padang Roko image, was brought from East Java by uh, Aditya Varma, the king, really to settle, to establish his power there in Sumatra. He was also Mahakala, protector of state, with a yuan. And there is this most, this is an image which is probably the one of the most famous, which is in the Musée Guimet, which was uh, made for a Tibetan monk in Dadu. Dadu is Beijing, it was the capital of the yuan. And this show a very special aspect of Mahakala, the protector of the, not the tent, but the protector of the, in fact, the space which, the disk of Vajra, which protects the mandala. So this is an iconography, again, which is really, which we only found in this part of Tibet and uh, Yuan iconography. But I just mentioned it to show you that Mahakala appears there also as a protector of state. And we know that um, these images were made in order to protect the state, but also in order to somehow give energy to the armies fighting against the Sol and Song. And temples were distributed all around the country. So it was really in the Yuan Empire in China, a real major also state deity as it was in Yunnan. So um, showing you that is a major deity. I mean, from Lucky Sarai, again, an image on the left screen where he's seated, and this iconography was transported through Tibet to Central Asia. Uh, at the period where the Yunnan, uh, the Yuan, sorry, were ruling, in fact, the Hogao Cave 465 is a tantric cave, which is sometimes called Tibetan cave, but which belongs really to the late 12th, early 13th century, so to the, this, the same period and the image which we just saw. So this shows you that he is really um, a major deity also outside uh, India. I mean, in really a belt starting from Central Asia, where the Yuan were, to Dadu, then coming to Yunnan and uh, going, in fact, and also in uh, Indonesia. And we can ask whether in fact, the development which took place in Indonesia, in East Java, and then in uh, for Sumatra, in fact, they are not related, it's very contemporary practically with what happens on the continent, that it's really, but it, you don't have it in India. So showing that it's probably connections. Now I come to the third one, with of course a major, major deity uh, for all Buddhists all over Asia, which is Avalokiteshvara. So Avalokiteshvara, the set of image which you have on the screen was erected in the second half of the 13th, 13th century in uh, Chantijago. And I suspect that the Mahakala, which we have seen, was there also as a protector of this set of images, which were in fact produced by Krita Nagara to the in the memory of his father. This is 
a set of sculptures with in the center an aspect of the Bodhisattva known as Amogapasha. He is here eight armed, is quite damaged as you see. The complete sadhana describes, in fact, and is known, but in Tibetan version only, described of the Bodhisattva with eight armed and surrounded by four attendants from left to right for us. You have the Tara, the green Tara. Then you have the young man Sudana Kumara, who is in search of learning and wisdom. Then at the proper left of the Bodhisattva, you have Hayagriva, the terrific deity who is always at this side, and the Brikuti, who is somehow an ascetic female aspect. Now, uh, what, what is this sadhana? Well, this sadhana um, was, in fact, one monk had a vision of this group, and this monk in fact, it's a Kashmiri Shakashi Badra, whom we have seen earlier at the talk. And we are told that he was ill and he was in the Bodhi Mandir in Bodh Gaya when he had this vision of Avalokiteshvara. And of course, he was cured. So he wrote this sadhana. And this sadhana is here. The interesting is Amogapasha uh, is a bodhisattva who is known in India. I mean, we have depiction of Amoga Pasha, but not with eight armed, with six armed only. And here is a, this is really the, we don't have eight armed Amoga Pasha with the four attendants in North Bengal, in Bengal, Bihar, but we have here this huge group in Chandijago. And in fact, this, one can, when one knows the history, one understand how it's possible the point is that the monks had to leave at a certain moment South, East, South Asia. They had to leave Bihar, Bengal. And some Tibetan source says that they went all to Jagadala, really leaving Bihar behind them. They met, they all went to this um, monastery in North Bengal, and then they separated in two groups. And one went to Tibet, and one went to Southeast Asia. The point is that there is really in the 13th century, early 13th century and all through the century, but especially early 10th century, images which are made, which really relate clearly also to the Vikrampur area. There is also a huge, um, very beautiful Arapachana Manjushri from Chandijago, which is also in the Hermitage, which also relates to a similar image in the um, Vikrampur area. You have also uh, similarities in Hindu iconography, um, Vishnu on Garuda, for instance. I mean, showing really there is a connection between East Java and um, Vikrampur. And for that, I just refer you to a paper by Pauline Lunsin Skurler, who wrote on this topic some years ago in two papers in Artibus Asi. Now, uh, the very same King Krithanagala, who had this group of images made in honor of the memory of his father, had the image made, which is on the left screen, which is a kind of summary of these five images. They are all put together. All the back is covered with inscriptions. And he had these images transported to Sumatra, where it was installed. At the same period, this group, which you see on the left screen, was reproduced in a number of small bronzes. They are 20, 22 centimeters in age. And again, some are in the darkness, but they are all similar. They are all coming from the same mold, in fact. And those which you see are the, the two which are in Holland. One is in Leiden, the other one is in Tropen Museum in Amsterdam. And in the darkness, down you have one in Berlin and one in the Metropolitan Museum. But <laughs> they are all the same uh, images. There is also a fifth one, which I could not trace a picture, which is somewhere in a private collection. So what do we see here? We see first that a set of images trans is put in one single stela, transported to central Sumatra, where it settles somehow to the royal power. And at the same time, this very image is reproduced a number of times. And it's maybe possible that there were much more which were made. The point is that these images were uh, brought back to Europe in the 19th century. And I really, I, I did not find any place where they would say where it, they were in fact discovered. I mean, there are only the, the two from Holland could be documented. The others appeared on the art market a long time ago, but um, they are then within, we know they are from Java, but where were they found in a temple or a special site? This. So um, 
I suspect that these small images, which are also made uh, under the reign of Krita Nagara, it's really one set of images, in fact, were made for some redistributing this power of the main image. So we have this image on the left screen, which we just saw now, brought by Krita Nagara in central Sumatra. And some 80 years later, Aditya Varman had this image of Mahakala brought to Sumatra, and he rededicated the Avalokiteshvara. So he bound together two images. So we have a situation, as we will see after a moment, which is also seen in another country of South, Southeast Asia, Far East, I mean, continental Southeast Asia, let's say. So when I think that Avalokiteshvara is the deity of the center, he is peaceful, he settles the power, he is the one also rescuing the souls, and Mahakala is more the one who really protects the space. And there we go to the continent, to the Dali Kingdom again. Uh, from a very earlier period, uh, state deity has been an aspect of Avalokiteshvara. I mean, there is a tale about it, saying that a monk came from India and the image emerged out of him and it was a Bodhisattva, an image of the Bodhisattva was made and installed in the mountain. And this, uh, the left and white, um, the left image in black and white, in fact, is a detail from a scroll which was dated from the 10th century. The one on the right is from the 11th century. So you have this central image of, oops, sorry. Who appears here? You have these two images on the left, uh, in the left and in the center. They are in the same manuscript. And you see that he's really like a column, like a pillar. Uh, he shows with the right hand the Vitarka Mudra, so the argumentation, as if he would be teaching, so to say. And a feature which is really not Indian at all, Indian would not make it, is the left hand showing the Varada Mudra. The left hand is to the. So he has these two gestures. But the interesting thing is that not only is the state deity at the center of the worship, is that his images were also reproduced in a very large number of examples. And the one which is, for instance, in the lower right corner is just here around the corner, if I may say, in the British Museum. You have, see the, this, you have a phenomenon which is practically identical to what you have seen in um, Sumatra in Java with a multiplication of the image of one of the central deity. So in uh, the Dali Kingdom, this is what the situation which you have, which is similar to the situation which you have in Indonesia. You have Avalokiteshvara and you have Mahakala. One as a central deity and Mahakala known to be there as protector defending the state. So just to remind you, and here the, is very, very beautifully, it's not dark. Uh, it's from Akala from Lakisara. <laughs> it's got back its colors, it's light at least. Um, with a three example, you have the large one from Badam Loko on the right side, the one, one from uh, the Dali Kingdom and one in Lakisara. So the iconographies are in fact, it's the same character. The iconographies are the same. The main features, as you see, is a Kapala the skull and the knife, they are really there. Also, it's way of being depicted with ferocious features, with a big belly, with a, a garland of skulls. So it's really the... So mm, now, having a look at that and knowing the material in India, I, I, was, I must say I was always puzzled by the fact that these images in India, they are some more orphans. They are found there in monasteries. We identify them through text. We um, can study their development through style and iconography, both go together. But uh, as I must have said, um, I always wonder about how were they really seen at that time? I mean, uh, they were worshipped, but they had to, feel, to fulfill some function in, in the monastery, but also in the society. No? The monastery cannot exist without the society around it. So Lucky Sarai, 
um, is a place where you have four such Mahakala. And here is again very dark, it's the one on left screen, which was very much full of light for a moment. Uh, two are still in situ. These are the two images which are in the center. I'm very much sorry if it's, it's darkness. And uh, one is in the Metropolitan Museum, uh, which is a seated one on the right screen. And the one on the left um, is, as I said uh, a few times, is in the Hermitage. So what, why this abundance of beautifully, very nicely preserved Mahakala from the area of Latisaray? So we have to, to bring back to remind us that uh, 12th century is a period where the monasteries, they were first losing since already late 10th century. They were, if I may say, losing the support of the society around them. The Brahmanical temple was really becoming more and more important and the people were more donating towards the Brahmanical people, the temple than to the monastery. On the other side, you had, of course, the threaten of the Muslim armies coming from the West. And I suspect that these images were built, were made with all these ideas in the background that one felt threatened. Shaka Sri Badra, whom I mentioned, really had, when he was in Jainagar as a chaplain of the king, he had a vision of Maitreya. And Maitreya told him, go to Jagadala and leave India. I mean, leave. So that's where he took his monk, went to North Bengal, and then left for Tibet. I mean, this is, you can say, oh, this is history. I mean, maybe not real history, but it really reflects somehow the state of mind of the people at the time. The monastery were really disappearing one after the other. They were threatened. We know that some of them were plundered, destroyed. And I think the Mahaka, the, political power also, the Pala dynasty disappeared also at the end of the century. I mean, it was just reduced to very, very tiny space in Bihar. So this atmosphere created this, um, yeah, there, there was atmosphere of fear and of being threatened. And Mark Hala, of course, was the one protecting, the one protecting by excellence. Yeah, this was just to show you where it was like Sarai was in Bihar. Uh, so, in uh, going back now to going to Avalokiteshvara, we have seen that in these two parts, in the Dali Kingdom or in uh, Eastern Java, and then brought back to Sumatra, he, he must have been, I mean, in Dali is known, he was at the center, he was a state deity, he was really the one settling the, the power. And what do we have in Lakisarai? I, I wonder because Images of Avalokiteshvara are very, very numerous in South Asia, very, very numerous in, in Eastern India, under a number of aspects. But in the 12th century appears an image. Two of them here are found are from Lakisara, the one on the left and the one in the center. One was found on the Ganga, not far away from Lakisara, and you can see it today in Birmingham. It's a very tall image, nearly two meters in height. It was found with the so-called Sultan Ganj Buddha. And uh, I do remember you, Shakar Shivadra. When did he write his sadhana on Amalga Pasha? Well, he had the vision of him because he was ill and he had the vision in the Bodhi Mantir. Avalokiteshvara appeared and he was saved. No more disease. Well, this reflects again um, that the Buddhist, the Buddhist monastery took over at a certain moment for the society, for the normal devotees, not especially the monks, but it was maybe um, a way of addressing the population who was sustaining financially the monasteries, took over the fact that they could cure disease. Maybe they had doctors, they had maybe developed these medicines, I do not know. but. From that period, we have this kind of image, which are described, which is described in sadhanas, and this is an aspect of the bodhisattva. I describe it after a moment, which is said to cure disease. And you see him seated on the lion. Well, the lion he took it from Manjushri. Uh, you see him with a sword on the lotus. You look more properly the two images on the right; they are clear. The the sword he got it also from Manjushri. 
He has a trishula with a snake. Yeah. Um, behind his right, and this he took from Shiva. He has also a white skull as with white flowers, we are saying, which is always seen behind the <coughs> here, which he also got from Shiva. So there is with the, uh, an image which has been artificially uh, made, produced. It's not the end of a development. I mean, many images of Avalokiteshvara, you can start from the very early in period in Gandhara and go then to Ajanta and go to the caves in Western India and then go to Eastern, and you see the development of the iconography. This is a new iconography, which is, of course, did not survive the destruction of the monasteries. But this shows that he can be also a protector, but he's considered here to be a, a medicine, some a doctor. But that still doesn't tell us, does he have there, or did he have any relay, any position, any un to be understanding of being at the center of, of the state, like he was in Delhi, or like he might, must have been in Chani Jago in Eastern Java? Well, this was a question uh, which remained unanswered, which remains still unanswered, however, however, Um, and this, before I go to this uh, question of uh, what he could have been, in fact, I want to show you again these two images which are uh, from Lucky Sarai. They were found, in fact, in the 19th century by Waddell, Austin Waddell. They were found together in a well. They are in perfect condition. There is not a scratch. Usually you have the nose which is broken. They are in perfect, perfect conditions. I mean, they were not just thrown away thrown in a well when the, the monk left. No, they were very properly, very carefully disposed in a well, hidden till the late 19th century, where they were excavated, I mean, thrown or found, and yeah, they were brought by Weddell here in London. They were offered to museums in London who refused them, and then they were sold to Berlin, always together. They were in Berlin in 1945, and they left also together in Berlin for Russia, I mean, Soviet Union. So they, and they are still together. So thousand years, these two images are together. So I, I, for me, um, you can say uh, it's an interpretation, which I'm making, of course, but we all interpret in a material. The fact that they were found together in a well, really hidden, protected, it's as if Mahakala is, in fact, the protector of Avalokiteshvara. In which case, we could say that the relation is like you have in the Dali kingdom. When one protects the other, both are there related to the, to the state, to the center of the power. Oh, this, I hope that the next one will be better. Oh, no, this is a tragedy. This is really a tragedy, because... Um, well, maybe what I can do after the talk, I will. Uh, I must have the picture separately, and then I show you that the, they should come. Um, luckily, there are excavations now in uh, Lucky Sarai and in the site called Jainagar. In fact, it's a huge red hill. It's called Lal Parvat, and in fact, there under there are, um, they found traces of monasteries, traces probably also of a palace. I mean, with very very heavy walls. And they found out this lintel. Well, this is not any lintel. This is, of course, the lintel is broken. You have only two thirds. I'm really very much sorry for that. Um, I will finish it and then I show you the slides uh, to will understand better. Uh, what, what we see here is fact Avalokiteshvara in the middle. I mean, you have a lintel with three niches. One is lost. The one which was at the center is a depiction of a dancing Avalokiteshvara. He is depicting as dancing as Euruka was doing. And on the other side, the one he's dancing also is a mantra free dancing. So I suspect that the lost one, maybe they found it, but the lost one was Maitreya. Because really you have these three characters which are bound in certain images in uh, Eastern India. But what I wanted to show is this uh, lintel with Avalokiteshvara dancing in the center of the composition, is that he takes over the position of Heruka who is a dancer. He, the lintel must have belonged to a major temple, probably 
definitely brick, uh, built in bricks. Uh, probably uh, there you have to trust me, and in a huge image of the Buddha, which is only known through huge fragments, which are in the Indian museums, which are found there. And uh, what I wanted to suggest is that this shows that um, in Lakisarai also, at a certain moment, somehow, there was the past, there is, we can maybe understand that Avalokitesvara was also seen as a central deity, uh, protecting the shrine, because he's really at the center, just above uh, the entrance. He's like Hiruka dancing, to, trampling on the enemies, so to say. So maybe he, there is also a way of understanding him there when looking at what is happening in Southeast Asia and in Yunnan as being, but only for a very short time, because it's, it's unique. You don't have it anywhere else. You don't have anywhere else this amount of Mahakalas. You don't have anywhere else such a composition, a lintel with a dancing of Alokiteshvara. So for a certain moment, we can understand maybe the material of Lakisarai as also reflecting what we have in Southeast Asia or in Yunnan, saying that one is at the center and the other one is there to protect the space. And that's it. Thank you, Thank you uh, immensely for a, a fascinating, um, really, journey. Okay, uh, thank following you. Following the journey of, of all of the all of these images, um, and I should add that I mean my opening that the this one? relationship okay. between South and Southeast Asia is. Um, you know, is your concern? It's really nice to see that Southeast Asia becomes also Yunnan. That you're you're really looking yes. quite broadly, yes, um, and more broadly than often one does. And that, <laughs> that's really that's really useful, I think, to to get that uh, embedded in in, yes. the, in the discussions as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I'm sure there are many, many uh, questions. Which which, which is the USB? That, because I want to show the slides. E? Mm. Okay. I yeah. Will. Shall we look at these slides first? Then? Yeah. I, I hope I have them okay. here. Okay. Um, oh no. I don't understand. I. That's, no, this. Um, it's on another stick. Sorry. Okay. Well, we will. Um, we will look to the the talk this evening has been recorded actually, and um. And we will post it online, and we will work with the technicians to see if there's a means of yes. replacing the PowerPoint that's accompanied the talk tonight with uh, yes. with your actual PowerPoint. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That, it's true. That, that's that would be a good idea. To so. see some of the images which are blacking out um, due to the technology this evening. So, um, let's. Are you okay if we open up for questions now? Yes. So, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, the floor is yours. Don't be shy. Can I remove it like it? I have a question for yeah. you. There's something yeah. that you said you would not especially want to go into, but um, <laughs> because I'm here, <laughs> you want. And having done a PhD yeah. on Java, yeah. the whole concept of Bayerva and one. Mahakala. Mm -hmm. Do you like to discuss them briefly? Uh, excuse me. Uh, would you like to discuss briefly the whole concept of Bhairava versus Mahakala and the Sumatra sculptures? And uh, yes, uh, well, uh, I know that it has been always mentioned. I, I found everywhere Bhairav, Bhairav. Only one person identified as Mahakala is John Huntington. And is at, when you have, I, I see the image in the context where it was produced. It's really a Buddha in the headdress. That afterwards, it becomes a Bhairav. I have the same problem in India. I mean, the Mahakalas in India, I mean, you can differentiate them quite. I mean, you have a number of Bhairava, Bhairav, not Bhairav, but Bhairava in India, uh, which are very similar to the Mahakalas in Bengal, Bihar. But there is a difference which allows you to identify the one from the other. Bhairava has a sword like uh, Mahakala, but he has also the shield. That's, in fact, a pair of elements which belongs together in the Indian iconography. Durga has both, the fighting de deities. If you have a sword, you need also a shield to protect. This is what Bhairava, Bhairava, the Shiva, is. 
not Makala. The Makala is from Lucky Sarai or from, from the Buddhist, in the Buddhist context, they have one little sword. They don't need a shield. They don't need to protect themselves. In fact. And um, so what I want to say is that also in the Indian context, some colleagues put with a question mark because one don't know. But one has to look at really the iconography. And for, for this, this Mahakala paragraph, um, in the context when he was produced, it's a Mahakala, relating also to the other one from Tadijago and to the one from Padang Lavas. That afterwards he became a Mahakala. Or in, I, I don't know when, the, locally it might, it might have been seen as a Mahakala. This, I, um, I'm not familiar with the, the way the Indonesian changed from one to the other. This, yeah. okay. why? No, no, I... I can't, there is no answer, only that if you really look, you, you put yourself in this setting of this period of the Chandijago, at the, I mean, what has survived there, and um, of what Aditya Varman did, I mean, he re-consecrated the Avalokiteshvara and Sumatra. So, that's... And that's then you have this small look, this, the, the Buddha in the headdress. It's a but there's also two deities at the entrance to Chandi Simasari, one is yeah. Vandishra and one is Mahakala, supposedly, which gives me a huge problem because he has none of this iconography at all, except a big club, nothing else. Yes, but then you have the, probably the, the Mahakala as a, in a Shaiva context? Or? Yes, in a Shaiva context. Yeah. Yes. But the iconography... Well, the point is Mahakala, the term Mahakala itself, um, it's Yitzing, the, the Chinese pilgrim, who, when coming 7th century in India, says that there is a dark deity, hence its name, who sits at the door of the kitchen, or the place where the monks were eating, or the shrine, protecting it. And he says that it's always covered by oil for the worship, and then it has become black because of that. He calls it Mahakala. The point is that this or this Indian origin, I mean, at the beginning, mm -hmm. it, it's called Mahakala by eating. That is no Mahakala. It's if he is a protector of the kitchen, I mean of the food, of richness, is Jambala mm -hmm. in the context of Buddhism. If he's a protector of the shrine, is not the aspect of similar deity, which is called Vaishravana, who is a protector of the north for the Buddhist, and who is the husband of Hariti, the goddess of wealth and so on. So you have a, in in the in the Gupta, I mean, late Kushan Gupta and period, you have a deity who is there as a protector of a shrine or a kitchen or in a monastery, and um, who will make a pair with her deity, who has two functions. Somehow. He is Jambala. The re, he will become Jambala. He's not yet named Jambala, but he will become Jambala, Jambala giving the richness. And he is also Rashravana, who is a protector of the north and who has an arm, is well known from Gandhara art. And, and this is what is called by the Chinese pilgrim Mahakala, which I can understand. The Mahakala, which we have seen from Lakhisarai, as we have in Eastern India, is a very enigmatic origin, I must say. Um, there I cannot trace. Just like I mentioned for Abel Kseshvara, where you can really start in the Gandhra and Kushan period and you see the evolution of elements are changing, the attributes are changing. Or, I mean, but you see there is a, a line of evolution. For Mahakala, it's not there. So the knee is there in Eastern India. And it doesn't have anything to do with the Mahakala described by eating. And the point is that there is a Mahakala also who is describing Shiva, because Shiva is also a terrible dark aspect, rushing in the forest, and Pairava is the hurleur, I mean the one with, what do you say, hurleur? Screamer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this we know him also from the Gupta period. So it's, it's a, like a tough topic also in India. So it's no surprise that it's also... <laughs> a tough one. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I wonder if I could bring you back to, um, I have a lot of questions, I might try to ask two of them right now. Um, Bring you back to some things that you were just passing by at the moment when you were referring to the. I don't have the picture. Where, Sorry. Where where the deity is, where Mahakala in particular, but where the whatever the pair is, if it's Vajra and Mahakala, or if it's Avalokiteshvara as a replacement for Vajra. Yes. Um, and Mahakala. 
uh, what you might know about emplacement, actual emplacement on the ground within the monastery. Um, when you were speaking of Padang uh and in relationship to that, could you speak a little bit about your sources, what sources you're, you're, you're referring to? So when you spoke of Padang Roka, um, you spoke of uh, the king bringing the yeah. deity to protect the state. Yeah, that's... What sense do you have of actual emplacement there? Um, and how do you begin to think that? Um, well, the image, the image was found first uh, on the ground, falling and off broken also, the pedestal was separate. And... Um, I, I don't think that it was any any temple also. I don't remember to have seen anything about temples. Lo the same thing for the Avalokiteshvara, I mean the, right. the still. The, it's interesting in and of um, itself. I mean, that's yes, um, the, um, I, I do not know about the architectural setting of the images. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they would have had something, they would have built also a temple in bricks, like in Padang Lavas, also they're in stone, or they're so broke. Padang Lavas is such a destroyed site. All the monuments are small, but you see the we have seen just two sculptures from Padang Lavas, but all the material is such in a bad condition. And um, I want to, um, I don't know what the situation there, but I know that in India, the, the architectural material was re-employed, mm -hmm. reused. The bricks from the temples were used for people building their houses and simply, which I can understand. And when there were bronze objects, objects they were melted. <laughs> and then, so, so I wonder whether, um, I do not know what was the, what is the situation in Sumatra, how far this, these two images were enshrined, which had been, which would have been built for them. Uh, what I could read is that for the Avalokiteshvara, he was brought in one side and then transported in another side by Aditya Varman. So he reunited, in fact, the two images. Uh, but I do not know about the architectural setting of them. Mm -hmm. So it would have been strange, of course, to have them just standing like that. I mean, is a way of respecting the deity. You create a shrine. You don't see the... I mean, in India also, they were all in shrines before monasteries were I mean, destroyed. Right, right. I mean, I'm also thinking about the relationship to the, the you know, the uh, conception of a territory of state, because um, how, how do you begin to think about the emplacement within the architectural setting of the monastery um, in its representation or its allusion to state territory? Um, so that's, you know, that's the question of the mandala. And mm -hmm. when you have the painted mandalas, we see it in a sense. Yes. Um, you have to imagine the three-dimensional orientation yeah. of it. Yes. That was quite interesting, the way you got us to think yep. three-dimensionally out of the mandala. But to what extent do you have evidence to be able to demonstrate how that works on the ground? That's, kind that's, of, that's yeah. of course, impossible. Yeah. That's impossible because, I mean, the, the only place where you can do it in India, I mean, as far as Buddhist art is concerned, is when you go to the caves of Western India. Because they are the objects, the, they are in situ. They were never removed. They are carved on the walls. Right. Hmm? Uh, and um, in um, look, I mean, this Avalokiteshvara and the Mahakala from Lakisarai, they were found in a well, meaning that they were already not put anymore in their original uh, position. Mm -hmm. They were saved this way. And um, yeah, yeah, but that's interesting still because they're paired, as you say. They are paired. Um, Since so thousand years, they never leave in each other. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, I have not the picture on my um, notebook. Should I, I show ask that? one more question? It's really, it's really um, in the place of students um, who I'm sure are preparing their questions. Uh, so while we wait for that, um, because I think it's a point that a lot of people here will be interested in. Um, and it's the question of the, the local taste Yes. Um, as you called it. Um, so I'm wondering what ways we might have of thinking that question um, in a sense beyond local taste. That is, um, stylistics can be fairly easy to interpret in terms of local taste, aesthetics. Yes. But iconographic transformation yeah. can be something different. So if you're looking at a question of you know, a source or of one one particular uh, regional uh, development as depicting eight arms of a given deity. Yes. And in another region, be it in South Asia or Southeast Asia, you see the same divinity with the same attributes, but with six arms. 
that's a different question. That's not necessarily a question of taste. No. Possibly, mm -hmm. but how might you think about that otherwise? Are we looking at dissociation from textual source? Are we looking at new textual sources? How do you begin to approach that question? Uh, well, I would say I'm very suspicious. I'm, I'm very careful in ending text. Yeah. I think that very often when concern, um, I mean, always this Eastern India part, the text follow the image. I mean, um, um, Shakyashi Badra um, had this vision and he described Amoga Pasha with eight arms. But Amoga Pasha with his four, with four attendant figures, he could see them already in images everywhere. Only the Buddhist Advar did not have eight arms, he had six arms. Um, because it was already existing. And Amoga Pasha, as a protector, was already existing in the region. His, his position is to rescue the source of the Preta, the source of the dead people. And uh, in, particularly in the region of Bodh Gaya, because, and this is where we have to put the things in context, and it's complicated in India, but it's complicated everywhere. Because Bodh Gaya is in fact source of Gaya, the city of Gaya. And Gaya is a place where the Shraddha rituals are taking place, right. still today, where you go to have ritual paid for the rescue of the soul, or the saving of the soul the, of your ancestors. There was there, I would say, a financial market. It's, we have to see it like that also. Gaya was already in the 8th, 9th, 10th century, a place where people were coming for pilgrimage, for the paying respect to the soul of their forefathers. Facing that, the Buddhists developed a Namoga Pasha image, which is, I mean, this image is mainly found in the region of Bodh Gaya Kukia. Kukia is a site which is not far away from Gaya, but he has, he has only six arms. He has six arms, but this function is to rescue the people and to rescue the dead souls. And so, and he's named Amoga Pasha in the text also, and he has also the Pasha and so on. So in fact, um, and they are early image, 9th century. But many, um, meaning early image also doesn't mean that they were no more worshipped, they were there. They were there in the monasteries, they were there in the temples. So when he had this vision, somehow he had a vision of something which he had seen already, but he put it with eight arms, mm -hmm. which is very interesting because there, I mean, an image with eight arms made for me, more sense than an image with six arms. Because with eight arms, you really root on the eight directions of space. With six arms, you can say you have four directions, and the zenith and the nadir. But it's not like the eight arms. So he made the most perfect. So it's why I say the text can come after the image. But it's a transformation, because here the Chandi Jago, it's clear that they knew about this vision of the sadhana, which he wrote, and they created it. I mean, it's a very complex uh, set of. But um, I always thought, uh, I always consider there is a visual iconography and a, I would say, literary, literary uh, iconography. Uh, they run parallel. They don't, uh, uh, and very often the, the images, I, mean, I, mean, I think really in this case, for instance, it's clear, but just it produce a better one through its visualization than the one which was existing. A, a question? Yes. The Dalai Kingdom, does it talk about uh, the ritual of the Mahagala in the Dalai Kingdom, the image from Southeast Asia and the text in China? Right? Yeah, the text, the, the image from South Asia, the from, from India, Bihar, Bengal, Nepal, there were connections, this road, the West-East road. This is what uh, Megan Bryson found. She, I, I'm not, uh, um, I don't know Chinese, I must say. Hmm? So I rely on what she has written and quite brilliantly as she has written on it. Um, she found out that the, ritual, the texts of ritual veneration of the Mahakala were really coming from China. They are Chinese texts. But they, they do not integrate, they do not have the Mahakala as you have it in the, um, in the Mogao cave or the, the one with the, no, he has a uh, club on the hands which is a lot of the so-called tent the, of the pavilion, which is who is the, the, the main uh, Mahakala of the Yuan court. This they don't have. They have texts coming from this part of the, con of the uh, continent, 
but they look for the inspiration for the image to the West. This is the one. And I think it's because they, since I mentioned that shortly, that there was at least, at least one seal from Bodhgaya has been found in the treasure of the three pagodas. Um, and I mean, there, there was a rule, I mean, and there was a trade route, which was very important between Eastern India and the Yunnan. Uh, so I, I do guess that the monks were um, probably, um, they were aware of what was taking place in Eastern India. But as I show, I try to show, the image in Dali Kingdom is really a unique image. So it's really a Dali image, but it has element coming from the, from the West, if I can say. You see? And it has elements like the Damaru, the small drum, which you find at a later period in Nepal. So it makes you again on the same road. See, this, that's what's... Thanks so much for your lecture. Um, I'm originally from Calcutta, but... Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, for the last three years, I was working with the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage in Tamil Nadu. And one of the things that I found very uh, fascinating was to discover early Buddhist presence in the Tamil Nadu. Yes. And so why, why you trace the um, travel of monks from Kashmir to Bengal and uh, in Southeast Asia? But like the Pallavas especially, they are also in contact with so many Southeast Yes, Asia definitely. Earlier. So while you are talking about this effect of Vajrayana and spreading here, I'm thinking how, how much is this earlier contact of the Buddhists and other people between the Southeast Asian region affecting uh, the travel of monks as you have traced from Kashmir? Have, do these contacts from South India completely die away? Yes, well, the, the, the Buddhist Advar Francent from the Dali Kingdom, this so called Ajaya, Balukteshra, Standing Street, and so on. Uh, the, um, as a matter of fact, it, the image has been brought at a certain moment by an Indian monk. It's part of a history of this image. Uh, stylistically, um, the origin of this first image, which is of course no more there, uh, has been discussed as being from Southeast Asia, but there is definitely an element from the Pallava, which is this circular, uh, you know, Pallava and, the, and it remains a Chola period. They have this series of um, cloth garments forming large round circles in front of their, I mean, hanging from the girdle. And this is what you have at this Avalokiteshvara, showing that very far away in the background of this image, there was an element from South, um, South India. Uh, there are um, elements from South, in objects from South India, which are found also in Sumatra, um, image of, one image of Avalokiteshvara, if I remember, a seated one. Um, also, two, at least two stone images, uh, which either they came from Sri Lanka or from South India by the time of the Chola, then, were also found in North Sumatra. Then somewhere in, uh, in Java was found a very interesting small bronze shrine, uh, which I only know from a, an exhibition of Indonesian art which took place 30 years ago, and it was never, it never appeared again in exhibition, but it's kept in, a, in Jakarta. And this is a, not a copy, it's similar, it's identical to a similar small shrine from Nagapatinam. Nagapatinam is a major Buddhist site from the Chola period in South India. So showing that there were also, of course, connections, the Chola were great traders. I mean, they were also quite active in the Bay of Bengal and Southeast Asia. But this, um, for this development, which I've shown, this you have to look in, to the north, I mean, to Bengal, Bihar. You don't have it in uh, South India. South India, the, the monks were very much isolated. And uh, we have traces in the site like Kukihar, for instance, of quite a number of monks who came in the ninth century and made donations and stayed in Kukihar. They came from Kerala. They came from um, Chula Mandala, so from, from the south. So there was there, of course, but um, this is the amazing things. Kanchi, Kanchipuram uh, was a major Buddhist site, and there is nothing, nothing, nothing left Buddhist in Kanchipuram yeah. because yeah. the Ch Chola came and uh, eradicated it, yes. So that's. Um, if you tell someone in Kanchipuram there's something Buddhist there, they look crazy. Because all you see is Shiva and Vishnu. Yes. <laughs>
I tried. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know my. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, I'm going to say she's going to bring this question. Um, there is an image, so the same amount of pictures that I'm going to show this. Um, there is a. Can you speak a bit louder because <laughs> we still. Okay. Um, you showed us the, 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 the location that you received it on the night. Yes, yes, yes. And there is a similar image in the Madras Museum today, uh, which was made in the Chola Museum. Oh, really? And has it is a Chola Museum. It's in Avalok, yes, Vala? It is, yes, it is in Avalok. Oh, that's great. The lion is a Chola lion, and the Jata Mukhan is very typically Chola, and the taste of it. Oh, thank you. So I was wondering um, if you find a link now with this image. So this is an isolated image. I'm well, I do not know it. Uh, uh, that, that's a point. Is that you? Because Buddhist was really eradicated during. I mean, the Jains suffered a lot also during the Chola period at a certain point. And I mean, once the main monasteries, which were in the north, I mean, for Vajrayana, disappeared. Um, and this, I mean, only isolated, I mean, very isolated examples of the presence of Buddhism remain. And um, as I just mentioned, you you had a city like Kanchipuram, which which is known from the source as having been very very active, and there is nothing nothing. So, um, I mean, recently also, I mean, recently maybe five ten years ago, uh, there was a very Beautiful um, Buddha seated in the so-called European Badrasana and so-called European way, teaching with a number of characters, which was also found in a small village somewhere in Tamil Nadu. It's now in Madras. So you have these isolated finds, which unfortunately you can't relate to a, an archaeological context because usually they are found by a farmer in his field or in a river, and um, someone there. The context is lost, in fact. Yeah. But of course, if you, if you, I mean, I, I, I do not know this image. Thank you for telling me. Um, well, that shows that, of course, the concept was there, but the concept emerged really suddenly there in the region with major great images. So, but thank you for telling me. I do not understand very well your question. Okay. Um, well, I'm just thinking about the traveling of the, uh, of the iconography and the movement in, for example, East, uh, Eastern India. To okay, the yes. Southeast Asia. Um, you mean how was it transport, how, how the image were, tran were well, transferred from one place to the other? Images, no, not just. No, not only the text. Uh, I, I, I suspect that um, they had sketchbooks. This is well known for, for Nepal. They were sketchbooks, which the artists were using. Were kind of repertoire, <laughs> showing you, we see, we see, we see, how should it be made, and with detailed sketches, you have this attribute, this attribute, which are depicted. And um, because the point is that if you only speak, if you only say, I mean, luckily, people don't say anymore only that sadhanas are the sources of the images. I imagine a monk coming from India or anywhere, and he goes somewhere else. And he, has, he wants to produce an image, a cast image or a stone image of one special aspect of Manjushri, or doesn't matter who. 
And he knows the sadhana because he knows how to visualize it. He knows the sadhana is in fact a tool for visualization and for identifying oneself to the deity at the end, but not for producing an image. So anyway, he knows the sadhana. He knows this is like, and he said to the artist, this is what I want. And I describe it to you. And the artist is, he has never seen a katvanga. He has never seen a knife for cleaning a scope. How would it made it? Unless he gets an image for doing it. So I suspect that both things are working together. They were also sketchbooks helping to construct the image. Can I ask you a question, Mr. Bowen? Um, yes. Just a clarification. When you said movement, are you talking about the gestures of the, the physical gestures of the imagery, or are you talking about the traveling of the images? Sorry, okay. but I don't have okay. them. Okay, she understood correctly. I was interested. Thank you. It's all right. Yes? Would the, uh, wouldn't would small uh, bronze pieces be quite widely traveling with monks, etc. Yes, mean, yes. It's not beyond belief that you would scale up a, a three-inch bronze into a three-foot stone. <laughs> and that would certainly support any sketches and texts that you yes, uh, Yes, yes, uh, but, um, yeah, it's, it might be, but I think a sketch speaks much more than a small image. I mean, that, than a already produced small image, huh, where you would have the the kapala, the knife, and other attributes. Um, well, it, it might be, but I, I mean, since we know there were sketchbooks which were used in Nepal, you know, that's of course sketchbooks were some more perpetual books used and then they were just thrown away. That's why nothing survived. It might be, but uh, I don't want to speculate too much. A that. bronze will survive a sea crossing more readily than a paper sketchbook or a palm leaf sketchbook. But they transport that on their back or the monks? They... I mean, I mean, they I would mean surviving wise. Not oh, the surviving wise. Well, of course, if there is a shipwreck, the manuscripts <laughs> just is thrown into we're the we're water. We're ashore with our three inch bronze. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, well, maybe we'll wrap it up. Um, I really thank want to thank you for this. Before we before we give you our last um, our last thanks, I want to flag um, a couple of other talks that are coming up that you you've reminded me of, oh. um, <laughs> and it also means that there there will be links certainly in in the kinds of questions and the materials that are being addressed. The first one that comes to mind is I believe it's our next talk in the series um, by Marika Kloka. Um, who has worked on some of the materials that um, mm. that Padim was working on this evening, and I think it, it, it will certainly offer some interesting uh, further discussions uh, on these materials. And then the next talk is is uh, perhaps more tangentially uh, related, but it's um, it's by uh, Sienza Piret on the sixth of March. And uh, while the topic that Sipiret will be working on is most specifically related to this question of uh, language and image, not just text, but text also, but language and image. Um, he also has been working on questions of relations between uh, Indian Shraddha and uh, let's call it Cambodian Shraddha. Not quite sure if that's what we should call it, but maybe we should. And um, so some of the, the questions of relation between imagery and funerary ritual that you touched on very, very briefly there in your discussions of Ufaya. So please do keep those talks in mind, but also the other talks in our series, um, which are advertised on the Central for Southeast Asian Studies website. And that's all I have to say. Oh, and thank, thank you. you very, very much for um, no a fascinating week.